I start, you know, I, after watching some of these other talks, it really got me thinking, and I, I really started to wonder what the crowd out here is like today. Obviously, people here are very educated about sustainability and energy in general. I'm actually quite surprised just by even just by talking to people in the lobby. But if I were to have, if I were to make two categories, like doomers and cornucopians, which doomers are like people who believe, okay, we're screwed. Uh, the world's going to end, the Earth's going to kill us all, and then, you know, Mother Nature can live on without us. And then, like, the cornucopians are like, no, there's plenty more where that came from. Don't worry, we're all going to be okay. We can go on and expand throughout the universe and take over everything. Um, if you had to force you into one of those two categories, and obviously there's a gray area, can I get the number of people that would raise their hand if they would say they were a cornucopian? Okay, now can I get people to raise their hands if they were to say they were a doomer? <laughs> I know you hate the word, but I'm just, I'm forcing you right now, like, you know, they do in American politics. Um, <laughs> so, okay, that's great. Well, that actually helps me a lot. Okay, today I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story of my transition, my personal transition through a wide range of emotions that relate to those two hideous terms. Rethinking progress with energy and art. To start with, I'm going to show you, uh, right away, I'm going to hit you over the head with something that I, I did. It's something that changed my life. It was an art project that changed, literally changed my life. It's called the Mondo Spider. Well, what can I say? The Mondo Spider is our baby. It's three months was to build. Was Jonathan Thibodeau built the Mondo Spider with me? Six months to build. Uh, $15,000 budget and probably 20 times that in man hours. I did the legs. And why, did you, why did you do this? It was art. We did it because we could. <laughs> and is there a history of mental illness in your family? <laughs> you tell me. <laughs> only, only in the older siblings. <laughs> All right. Okay, we're gonna drive it. Looks back. fantastic. Let's see it. Let's see it in motion, yeah, guys. Come on, you guys. Let's step away. kids' reactions to the Mondo Spider. Full throttle! <laughs> I, um... I gotta say, growing up, I was, believe it or not, not a normal kid. I, you know, but I did dream of space colonies and jetpacks and robots. Um, I fundamentally believed the human race was good and that we could do good and, and that the sky was the limit. Possibilities were endless. As long as you could dream it, it could be done. I love the idea of progress, of the progress of the human race. I embraced this wholeheartedly as a child. And as I grew up, I started thinking about the future a lot, like what future generations might live like. I started asking myself questions, and this is how it all started. How many generations after I die do I care about? Think about that for a moment. I still don't really know the answer, but I know I care about my grandkids, and I definitely care about my, my, my kids and my great-grandkids. I don't have an answer to it, but I know that the future matters, and I know that the, the sustained propagation of the human race matters to me a great deal. I started, when I got into high school and university, I started studying the sciences. I'm actually an engineering physicist in my background. Um, and one of the things I was always fascinated by was the world population curve. This was the first time I had ever really grasped what it means to have something grow exponentially. Now, the odd thing is, is economists call this steady growth, like 1% steady growth or 2% steady growth. It's anything but steady, if you ask me. It looks like a bloody explosion. But yet, this is steady growth. This is the dominant economic paradigm, at least in terms of population and GDP growth that we've experienced for quite a long time now. In fact, I did a calculation and I showed that if we're, you know, let's say we're at you know, 7 billion now, let's say we were to grow at like 1% per year. After 5,200 years, 
the mass of humans on Earth would exceed the mass of the Earth itself. You know, like, how can that work? That's, not, that's completely ludicrous. And if we were to think of the economy like that and, and resource consumption like that, clearly this cannot continue. Now, I'm not going to give you guys a lecture on sustainability because I know, again, that so many of you understand this stuff. But the reason why I show you this graph is it's the first of three images that were burned into my brain. Second is the peak oil curve. Now, I just drew this in there. I don't trust these numbers. <laughs> it is a limited resource. It's ancient sunlight. It takes millions of years to make this stuff, and we're you know, getting rid of it in a couple hundred years, right? The idea here is that you have this period of decline. The next was CO2 concentrations. And I, many of you have seen a curve that looks just like this. This is 280 parts for the vast majority of time, and it skyrockets exponentially, again, that word, uh, sometime after uh, the 1800s, 1900s. And you put these on top of each other. Artistically, scientists, bear with me. Artistically, you put these on top of each other, and they all look a little bit the same, with the exception of the curve for peak oil, <laughs> which is a, a bell curve, a normal distribution. And it kind of begs the question, Hmm, what if our population did that? And that's, that depressed me more than anything. I mean, the idea of us not really being able to progress as we have in the past, there being less energy, um, wasn't, you know, that's not the end of the world, but like this idea of this crash was deeply, deeply troubling. And I have friends who are very motivated by this. And I know there's many, many people out there who are reinvigorated by the idea of such a tremendous problem. But at the time, I found it very depressing. And then I thought, wait, what about peak oil? What if peak oil kind of like has a big battle with global warming? And like we run out of oil, so we can't produce the CO2 that's going to cause global warming. Well, as it turns out, it doesn't work that way. There's only a certain amount of fossil fuel on the Earth. And lots of it's easy to get, but, but there's even more of it that's really hard to get. And the energy required to get that oil out of the ground, that coal out of the ground, it just gets dirtier and dirtier and more and more CO2 intensive. In fact, peak oil actually exacerbates the problem with, with climate change. So my best friend's mom accused me once, and me and my friends, of only ever talking about two things, sex and global warming. And they're actually two flavors of the same popsicle, because it's all, again, about the, <laughs> about the continued propagation of the human race. And, Again, I started thinking more and more about global warming and more and more. And, and, and there's all these people out there that were like, no, 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 Lee, you have to understand. It's all about sustainability. Just live more locally, which is great. I love and I still love to this day. Um, live more sustainably. Reduce our consumption. We'll live a sustainable existence. We'll return to the earth. You know? And then, then there's the deep ecologists, or I'm not even sure what to call them, dark green environmentalists who are like, no, 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 don't worry. Mother Nature will take care of us. We're like locusts plaguing the earth, like a cancer that needs to be irradiated. And once we're gone, Mother Nature will live on without us. But both of these, and I don't know if this is true for everybody, but both of these, for me, were unacceptable. Deeply, deeply troubling futures that I couldn't really relate to. I, I, I love the idea of camping, but that's maybe the extent <laughs> of my... So stagnation or extinction. And then I found music. And this was the first spark that led to a, a much longer string of artistic experiences that changed my life forever. I became a DJ. I started throwing uh, interesting parties. <laughs> <laughs> I started making artwork like what you see here. That's a 3D scan of my head. Uh, you can't really see this. This is called Slave Eater. It's a giant animatronic costume that I brought to Burning Man. Um, and then I founded the Eat Art Foundation, along with Rob Cunningham and his father, John Cunningham, with help from Jonathan Tippett, who built the Mono Spider with me, and Charlie Brinson, and many, many other people. We'd make audacious and improbable large-scale kinetic, robotic, and mechanized sculptures that investigate our human relationship to energy use. Eat Art stands for Energy Awareness Through Art. You know, at the Eat Art Foundation, we started to house artists, artists in residence who create wonderful creations and contraptions like the one you see before you. This is Daisy, the solar-powered tricycle. It truly is solar-powered. It has batteries in there. It's three-wheeled, and it's enormous. It weighs about 7,000 pounds. Inside our art facility, we have a two-ton crane and all sorts of welders and tools where we can make all this stuff. It also makes for a great place to throw a party. This is a 3E ROI. Now, I hope I get this right, Charlie. Don't get mad at me. Exegis. Exponential growth and energy return on investment. Three, the three E Roy. It's an exponential curve. It's hard to tell in this light, but it's an exponential shaped sculpture. 
that's very, very, very tall, probably 40 feet in the air with a human being launched off the top. And if, we'd like, if we could show video two now, this is of the EDART Foundation at EDART Power the VAG, our annual event in front of the Vancouver Art Gallery. This video is going to show, this is, thank you to OK Go uh, for the ideas here. Here is our pedal powered party. This is a very typical event for Eat Art, using solar power and human power to power the party, to power the music. With this kind of mentality, this new artistic perspective, that I could re-emerge from this hard, concrete, brick-and-mortar way of thinking, that engineering, that pure engineering perspective that was holding me back from discovering something possibly much greater. Um, I started going further and further down this road. It was an extremely long path and grueling. I'll save you the details, but uh, we, we just kept taking this furthest, this idea of using art to change the way we think about energy further and further. This is the Grammel Rail. With the assistance of the Vancouver design nerds, we, we built this. It's actually a, a pedal-powered rail car with a giant gramophone on the top. And this is the mobile solar panel. Uh, this was, uh, a, a, if you look on the left here, you'll see a sort of a, I don't know if you can see it, it's a solar panel that is deployable. You put it on a trailer, you can take it to events, and it produces three kilowatts of energy. And I, I talked to you about the Mondo Spider. I showed you that video right at the beginning. It was gasoline powered. I don't know if you noticed that. I, how traumatic is that? You build this beautiful art project and people appreciate it. And yet, it's just like partying until it's all gone kind of thing. Partying until the oil's all gone. It, it didn't sit right in my stomach. It didn't feel right. So this next video is going to show you how it all kind of came together. The Mondo Spider Zero Emissions Project. The last couple of weeks have been absolutely insane. We're well on our way to having a 100% electric walking machine. The first of its kind in the universe, as far as I know. We're really excited about it because this is sort of a, a, a monumental moment for EDART, which is uh, an organization I founded along with Rob Cunningham, his father, John Cunningham, that is devoted to promoting energy awareness through art. So tonight's the big night. Uh, we, like I said, we've been working towards this for a long time. We're going to unveil the Mondo Spider Zero Emissions Project. Mondo, the Mondo Spider is now a silent electric vehicle that can be deployed at any event, indoors or outdoors. We charge it off the solar power that you saw, the solar panels that you saw earlier. Give it up for uh, the Mondo Spider crew and the EDAR crew. It was this climatic moment 
where I suddenly started to be reinvigorated and felt that this, this childlike passion that I originally had that truly believed that we can live sustainably and we can progress. We only have to change the way we think about progress. We obviously have to, we obviously have to move on. We can't live the way we have in the past. That's obviously not sustainable and it's not going to work. But if we change the way we think about progress, we can start to think about ways that we can advance as a human species with art, the sciences, even improving things like biodiversity and our overall knowledge. And this is truly the future that I see and that's, and that's what invigorates my life. That's what, that's what motivates me today. Thank you so much.